Let's look at the Amid Bond with respect to understanding its strength from the point of view of uh, conjugation, resonance, um, hybridization, and molecular orbital theory. First of all, it's a really important bond. Uh, it's the bond that holds amino acids together in proteins. So here's one amino acid right here with the R group, the amino group, and the carboxyl group. Here's another amino acid. Uh, these two can come together uh, and form a link between this C double bond O and this N with the elimination of water in a reaction you'll learn probably next semester to form this bond which is an amid link and this specifically this C, double, this C bond N is the link that really holds the two amino acids together. Now let's look at that particular bond through the, through the perspective of resonance. Uh, here's the structure of the amid bond. You can see there's a lone pair in the nitrogen. This lone pair can actually move here. It's a wannabe bond. It can form a bond between the C and the N uh, and then it's can't have five bonds to carbon, so one of these bonds, the pi bond, must kick up to the O uh, to form the structure right here. Now I have a double bond between the C and the N. There's a formal positive charges on this end because there's four bonds to the nitrogen. Uh, there's a formal negative charge on this oxygen uh, because there's only one bond to the oxygen. Um, and basically these are both resonance contrib uh, contributors to the bond. So if you actually look at this structure, I think you'll see that um, there's a hybrid structure that can exist in which I've drawn it down here, in which this structure has a double bond, this structure has a single bond likewise for the carbonyl oxygen. So you can draw this uh, overall hybrid in which I have a partial double bond connecting the N and the C and the O. Likewise, the negative charge that was uh, not present here, but is in this resident contribution, uh, it's essentially distributed over this oxygen and this oxygen, so this would be the overall resonance structure. And indeed, this would suggest that this amide link, this specifically the CN bond, is stronger than you might expect because of the resonance, because instead of being a single bond, it actually has double bond character. Now, if you look at the geometry overall, um, if we look at this resonance structure, uh, this is sp2 trigonal planar, so all these atoms are in a plane. If you look at this resonance structure centering on the end. This likewise would be sp2 trigonal planar because I have three equivalent clouds coming out. So if these all these atoms are in the plane in that resonance structure and all these are uh, in the overall structure, you can imagine that the whole structure is planar. Let's look specifically now at hybridization atomic orbitals to understand uh, the amide bond. Again, we've shown here that this is the, the overall structure it looks like this is sp2, and the surface this looks like sp3. But we did say resonance would suggest that this is also sp2. Uh, let's look more carefully at this carbon here. Uh, and I have, looking at this, I would have three equivalent clouds coming out, hence I would want three equivalent orbitals. So what we're going to do is take the carbon, that has, which is a single s orbital. This is obviously the 2s orbital. It's got three 2p orbitals. So I'm going to take these four orbitals, and I am going to mix them to produce hybrid orbitals. In this case, I want three equivalent orbitals, so I'm going to combine an S and two of the P's. So th this was a kind of a slide that I thought might help you understand this. We're going to take all four of these orbitals, the S and three P's, throw them in this hat and do some magic on it. Here they are. Here's the S and here's the three P's. Shake the hat up a little bit and out comes four orbitals again, just like we saw before with MOs. But in this case, we've combined a single S and two of the P's to make sp2 orbitals. Uh, and we have a leftover AP orbital, which, which is actually not mixed. Now, the sp2 orbitals have teardrop shapes. Um, if you think about it, the s orbital is spherical, the p orbital is dumbbell shape. If I combine the two, I'm going to get essentially a teardrop shape. So let's take a look at how they're localized on the carbon. Here, I placed them on the carbon. This is a single sp2 orbital. This is a single sp2 orbital and a single sp2 orbital. They're, low, they're 120 degrees apart. Those are the three equivalent orbitals we need for bonding. Likewise, this is just a p orbital hanging up, and that will allow us to have, uh, to the oxygen, a pi bond between the carbon and the oxygen. Likewise, if we look at this oxygen, I would say that there's three equivalent orbitals coming out of here. So without throwing it into the hat, I think we can surmise that, in fact, that there are three sp2 orbitals that would derive. Here's one. And here's the other two. These are in a plane. These hold the lone pairs. This p orbital, therefore, allows a pi overlap uh, with this uh, carbon to produce the pi bond. Now, the key thing that most people didn't quite get, and this is kind of a hard thing to understand, 
Uh, if you look at this nitrogen right here, it looks like there's four clouds coming at it. But conjugation is, if, if we could conjugate this nitrogen, in other words, uh, put this uh, lone pair into a p orbital uh, that was sticking out of the plane of the board as where the paper is indicated by these circles, that would lead to resonance, uh, would one need to resonance, but also would lead to uh, stabilization by diluting the electrons over these three atoms. So in fact, this is going to be forced into sp2 hybridization so we can get uh, that kind of conjugation which stabilizes the molecule. And of course this, this resonance structure does actually show uh, this uh, sp2 nature. So again, here's the nitrogen. If we're going to have three equivalent clouds that with the lone pair sticking out in the p orbital, nitrogen likewise will be sp2. So into the hat we throw the orbitals, out come an sp2, an sp2, and an sp2. Those are capable of bonding to RNH. And then the lone pair would be in the p orbital, and again, capable with for, uh, uh, for resi uh, resonance and also for conjugation across all these p orbitals. Now let's look at a molecular orbit approach from Huckel. Again, here we have our amide that looks like that's sp3, but this is actually uh, resonance, can exist in resonance states between these two, and we saw that this carbon would go sp, this nitrogen would go to sp2, so the p orbital would have a lone pair, and it could conjugate with the rest of these atoms. Uh, here again is a planar view showing these p orbitals sticking up. Of course, there would be a lone pair here. So what we're going to do, since we only have one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three p orbitals, we're going to create huckles in which we have, uh, we're going to throw into the hat three p orbitals, out comes three huckle orbitals. Here's one huckle orbital right here. Here's another one, here's another one. Uh, and again, because there's three p orbitals, each one of these would have like trivalent three p orbitals linked in this line, but this is just one specific orbital. Now, this is an isolated p orbital. I cannot create energy or lose energy simply by bonding atoms together. I can place electrons in lower energy orbitals and create bonding, but overall the energy is constant. So if I combine these three orbitals, I'm going to get one lower in energy than isolated p orbital. That's this down here. We call this the pi uh, bonding orbital. I'm going to create one higher in energy than the isolated p orbital. That's called the antibonding. And finally, I'm going to have one in the middle. Uh, again, if these average out, this is also in the middle, and in fact, uh, it's the same energy as the iso isolated p orbital. And again, this very bottom one, I have no nodes. This top one, I have a node here. You can think of it as a p orbital sticking out of the plane. There's no overlap between these. In the very top one, I have two nodes. So in this case, how many electrons do I populate these orbitals with? Uh, well, I have a pi bond, and I have this lone pair, which we said is going to be forced into a p orbital. So I got a pi bond connecting this and this that has two electrons and another two electrons. So there's four electrons. Two go into this bonding pi orbital and two go into the non-bonding. And of course that's, that's sort of consistent with the lone pair here. But the whole point of the Huckel shows that these, these two electrons here are distributed not just between the C and the O, but they're distributed over all three of the atoms that have p orbitals, C, O, and N. That's diluting, that's delocalizing the electrons. Uh, in effect, contributes to the partial double bond character of the CN bond. So in summary, we've shown that through resonance, we can see how that nitrogen would have, that carbon nitrogen number would have partial double bond character, in fact, would have an average bond order of 1.5. Uh, we saw through hybridization of atomic orbitals how we can create uh, sp2 hybridization around the nitrogen, so it can indeed engage in pi bonding. Uh, and then finally we saw how Huckel orbitals, uh, with the fact that we have 3p orbitals that can be conjugated, can lead to stabilization of that CN bond, again, because we have uh, the pi bond, uh, it's not just located here or here, but it's distributed over all three atoms.